Christian Church. We're glad you're here with us. I'm Michelle Schenk and I'm serving as liturgist this morning. Reverend Lance Roberts will be sharing the message today and Reverend Bill Bloom is our Minister of Music. We are extremely grateful to Edie Lowenstein, Sue Lowenstein, and Sue's daughter Alexa Fisher to be our as our web techs. We are very grateful for their assistance. Later in the service, we're going to be sharing communion. So I invite you right now to just pause the service here and go get your juice and bread or cookie or cracker, whatever you'd like to share later, so you'll be ready. We always appreciate your prayerful support of the church and one another. And if you're able, we would appreciate your financial support so we can continue our ministries here at United Christian and in the wider community. You can mail your check to the church office or donate electronically on the website. Thank you. While we're not physically together, we'd like to remain spiritually connected and request that you send your joys and concerns to the church office or to Bill Garrett. They'll be shared on the Church Family Facebook page and as well as the weekly email announcements. The news of the last two weeks has been disheartening and discouraging, to say the least. But according to Shane Claiborne, he shared, amidst the deep tension, there is hope as we conspire to breathe together and with each other. So let's take a deep breath together and pause momentarily as we enter into the deeper realm of our worship. The Psalms are full of laments, crying out to God with what's wrong with our lives. People have been doing that for centuries, and this is a good time for laments. Psalm 61 says, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And breathe. Good morning. And this may surprise you, but of course I'm not Lance. He was scheduled to preach this Sunday, and it turned out that, well, as I got toward the end of the week, oh, he's fine, number one, he, he's fine, there's no problem there. But as I got towards the end of the week, I felt compelled. Some things had happened during the last week that I felt like not only were speaking to me, but they weren't letting go of me. The words were flowing about how some of my feelings, some of my thoughts were being created, and I guess I just felt like I needed to share these with you. So I asked Lance, is it okay? And he said, absolutely. Which kind of disappointed me because that meant I wouldn't have to grapple and struggle with what I was going through, but he said yes, and so I had to dive even deeper. So welcome to my deep dive into my life. Let me, let me set the stage for you. See, last Sunday during the adult forum class, we were scheduled to read and discuss the first chapter in this book that we were looking at, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. I had read the first chapter and it was intriguing. 
I, I felt like this could be a really good discussion. I was, I was ready. You see, sometimes I feel safe in matters of ideas and concepts and facts and figures. I felt like I was safe. I could join in the conversation. But early into that moment, things shifted. We never really got to the book because some issues were brought up concerning the death, the killing of George Floyd. And the, the opening became, how are you feeling about that? And the feelings were shared. Oh, were they shared? Because there were deep feelings about what was going on. The room was filled with conversation, not discussion, but conversation, a dialogue of how this feeling had just overwhelmed many of us. It was getting towards the very end of the time, and... I hadn't spoken. And so I was asked, what are you feeling? What do you think, Bill? And I must admit at that particular moment, I knew I had so many thoughts, so many feelings, but I didn't know how to put them into words that would make sense. And so I, I used the, you might say, well, the bell's about to ring, teacher. And I said, but I, I'll share next week. I said that, meaning it, but also not understanding how much I was going to experience during this week. Hmm. You see, it started out, I guess, early in the week. Our daughter, Catherine, posted something on Facebook, and I just sat there reading it, and it overwhelmed me. The depth and the clarity. I'm, I'm just going to read it to you so you can understand why that hit me so hard. Catherine wrote, I feel frozen right now because I don't know what to say or do. But I'm listening and trying to learn. I want to figure out how I understand my role, my privilege, and how I can still be involved in a solution. My heart is breaking, and I don't know how to sort through everything I see, read, or hear, but I won't be deaf, mute, or blind, because that's convenient, and a perfect example of my privilege. The world is telling us to change in an important and big way. I'm listening, and will keep being wrong until I figure out how to be better. <laughs> well, this, this hit me. It hit me hard in a good way. Because, you see, I realized Catherine had just put into words what I felt. She had just captured exactly the struggle that I too was having and I, I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that maybe this is some of the same struggle that many of us are having. This, this mountain that is before us and how can we approach it? Huh. And the question that came out to me was who am I? to think, I can do this? Now that's a real question. That, that's a real puzzle to me. You see, I'm almost 70 years old. I'll be 70 in a couple more weeks. And I guess I always assume that by now, with my age and wisdom, I would have a really significant grasp upon what life is about and meaning of life and how I fit in Sometimes I think I'm more lost than ever. My feelings about this George Floyd murder were real. It really surprised me to some degree. But it did. And I'm not sure exactly what to do, but I know I, know I have to do something. And so I'm left with this question, who am I 
to think, I can do this. Well, I want to add another story. You see, because I must admit, some nights I don't get a lot of sleep, anxiety, worry. And I'll tell you what it's about. It's about that virus called COVID-19. Now, I'm doing everything I can to try to stay safe, social distancing completely, staying at home whenever I can, unless I really, really have to get out, and only being very careful about that. And I'm, I'm concerned about my health. I really am. But not that much. Not in comparison to how much I'm concerned about my wife Nancy's health. I want to make sure she stays healthy. Or our daughters, Catherine and Amy, and their husbands. And I must admit, when I go to the grocery store, I'm concerned about them. When I think about our church, I'm really concerned about us on how can we get together and not do damage either to ourselves, our members, or, or the community. Who are we willing to put at risk just because we think we need to be together? I, I get concerned about these things. But the one that keeps me up at night is our granddaughter, our almost five-year-old granddaughter. I get frozen in many ways, just like Catherine said, about what if, what if I do something that infects Madison? What if she goes someplace and she's infected? What if? That's what keeps me up at night. And the other day when I was going to the grocery store, I find the times when to go when there's almost nobody there. I'm driving there and it hits me. It hits me, kind of like what Catherine wrote. It hits me, though, that as much as I can as a white person, as much as I can, and that's a big disclaimer, maybe I now understand what it feels like to be black, to be a black parent, a mother, father, grandparent, and watching their child or grandchild go out into the world, knowing that it's not a safe place, and, and the odds in many ways are against them coming back safe. They deal with that anxiety. They deal, deal with that fear. They deal with that trauma every day. You see, this, this understanding of this, this sense that I have about Madison, black people live with it every day. And it hit me. Huh. Now, I can't understand what it means to be black. I don't pretend to. But I do understand that that feeling is so deep. It's so authentic. It, it may be not just for somebody else. It may be the person. It may be the black college professor who dares to live in an all-white community still getting those looks. It could be the black nurse who is Exceeding the, speed, exceeding the speed limit just a little bit. And officers let white people go, but not her. It may be the, the black hourly underpaid factory worker who has been told that he or she has to be at work in spite of the risks or they'll lose their job and not be able to have unemployment benefits and so they have to show up, but on the way that, well, they look like someone else. And are stopped. You see, this fear, this terror, it hit me. This is what it feels like. And so, and so I realized that this struggle 
is what I would call a righteous struggle, a struggle that has to be engaged, the struggle that has to be what we are, what I am. And so the, the question started turning. Who am I not to think I can do this? What gives me the privilege to think that I don't have to worry about it? What gives me that, that thought that says, that's going to be a little bit too uncomfortable for me? What is it? that keeps me from believing that I not only can, but I have to struggle with this. Hmm. Well, let me, let me give you some ideas here. You see, first of all, let, let's, let's talk about the bad news first. The fight is real. The fight against injustice, it's not just on paper, it's real. I grew up in a town, Fort Worth, Texas. In the, I was born in 1950. And this was a pleasant town. And in many ways, it was a model of racism. Oh, it was kind of hidden, but systemic racism, white privilege, even though it wasn't being labeled back then, it was rampant. That's just the way it was, you see. My parents weren't outlandishly racist, but they certainly ad took advantage of the fact that they were white and we were white. We had privileges. And that town, well, you might understand something about it. I came across something interesting, just kind of a little sideline. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at a funeral in the funeral place right down the street from the church, and I was looking at all the old photographs, and <laughs> there it was. Did you know that in 1960, the Little League team from Levittown, Pennsylvania, went to the Little League World Series and won it? You know who they beat? The team from Fort Worth, Texas. And that's not the only thing those two cities had in common, you see. We know about Levitt, Mr. Levitt, who helped create an all-white community. That's why people moved in here. Cheap housing, and it was going to be all-white people. Fort Worth was not that different. Oh, there, there were minorities, but they knew exactly where they needed to be and not be. They knew exactly how to act and not act. And to some respect, the white folks, the white people, we weren't bothered. We weren't upset with that because after all, we were the ones that had no limits. Levittown and Fort Worth, they were models of racial injustice. Huh. Well, to try to get that to change, that is a fight. That's a huge fight. You see, there, there's going to be a tremendous amount of pushback. And I think we're starting to see it more and more and more. Because the ones who intentionally or accidentally, due lack of knowledge, are well settled into the white privilege camp. <laughs> they don't want anything to change. Those who are indeed in the racism camp, the white supremacists, they don't want it to change. And there's economic fears that's been played upon, and, and some of it's reality, but a lot of it's just the concept of scarcity to scare people. They don't want to change. You see, if you're on top, you don't want someone else to get in your parade. The fight is going to be real, very real. So, maybe we, I'm using the word we now. So, maybe the, cha the question changes, who are we to think we can do this? You see, it's, it's our struggle too, not just my struggle, I think. 
Who are we to think we can do this? Getting into this fight like we must. Well, let me give you some ideas. Because I think there's some real value in realizing why we can do this. First, we are on a mission from God. Now, I don't say that lightly. Anybody remember the 1980s movie, The Blues Brothers? Fun movie, Elwood and Jake Blues. They're out on a mission from God because they have to rescue the orphanage in which they grew up. They have to. And so in their blues mobile, they sing and dance and get into all sorts of mischief. And it's a fun movie. But throughout, whenever they're challenged, whenever there's that moment, they will claim, they will proclaim, we are on a mission from God. Huh. You know what? We are too. You remember what Micah said? And what is it that God expects of you? Not fancy shows, not these elaborate sacrifices, no, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. To do justice, that, that's paramount. You see, we are called to be on this mission from God. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we, we hear the conversation that Jesus then will then pick up and affirm about what we are about. That we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. <laughs> this is our mission. It is our mission. And it's not something that we just conjured up. It's not just something that is to make us feel good. This is from God. And I, I see that as a faith formation, foundation. I see that as the stepping off point where we start getting into who we are. I see this as being our calling, our commandment, if you will. If we are going to claim that we are people of faith, then we have to know those scriptures and understand how critically important they are in our lives, how we live our lives. We, we are on a mission from God. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that in any irreverent ma manner. We are on a mission from God. Huh. Just let that settle in, if you will. But also, on this, this journey, this struggle that we are, we're not doing it alone. I just want to lift up some of our denominational resources. Do you remember Sharon Watkins? She was the general minister and president of the Disciples of Christ, one of our denominations. President Obama ask her to be the first woman ever to give the sermon at the right after the day after inauguration the prayer breakfast that was our denomination the first woman ever to do that you remember William Barber that name is becoming more and more prevalent and known he's a minister in South Carolina a disciples congregation Remember how he burst upon the scene in the Democrat National Convention in his speech? <laughs> Somebody wrote about it that it was warmly received. That's like saying that Hurricane Sandy was a slight breeze. He took over that room. He, he preached to them. That Colosseum, that auditorium became a sanctuary. Oh, he laid it out for them, and they listened. It was fascinating to watch. Those of us who knew about him beforehand, we knew what was coming, but you could see the people mulling around. You could see the people kind of, eh, just one more speaker, and then they slowly started listening, and they slowly started inching up in their seats. And by the time he got finished taking them on a journey about what 
injustice looks like and what the parameters are and what the what the priorities are of what we must do it's immoral judgment of what we must be huh. yeah he owned that room in the UCC oh John Dormeyer the general minister of, of that denomination you know he's he's very well known for his work with white privilege He's very well been involved in all aspects of social injustice when it comes to especially racism. He's, he's the person you want to watch and listen to. You know, we, we have all these, and, and we had this course on, on white privilege that we presented. That came from the United Church of Christ. See, we have these resources, and many, many, many more. Huh. We're not alone in this. We are not alone. So not only are we, and I'm going to say this again, on a mission from God, but we are not alone. We have our brothers and sisters in faith that are willing and eager to walk with us. We will not go this alone. But you know what? Let's just look internally in our own church. Now, I have to admit, I'm not what I would call a social activist. I'm not. I'm not. I, I, I like to do good things. I try to do good things. But a social activist is someone who, that, that's a different creature. And I give thanks that we are blessed to have so many social activists in our church. Because they understand what's at risk. They understand what it means to be on the front lines. They understand and won't back down. And you know what? They will lead us if we will follow. And I'm serious about that. That we don't have to come up with all these ideas, but we need to listen to their words. We need to listen to what they are asking of us because they see the vision. And they have the energy. They have the commitment. They have the willingness to lead us in ways that we need to be led. So indeed, <clears throat> who are we to think we can do this? We have so many resources. We have so many ways that we can approach this. And we must. Because you see, when it really comes down to it, we, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones who are willing to live with the struggle, to fight the challenge, to live with courage and faith and perseverance. We are the ones willing to take on the risk of moving from convenience to commitment, from comfort to community. Huh. Catherine posed the question, what am I to do? How am I to struggle with this? Well, I don't know if that's really the right question. Maybe it really is, how can I not struggle with this? Because, you see, in the end, I am convinced we are the ones who cannot think we can't do this. Indeed, may it be so. Amen. and
around 10 years old and I still love my buttons. They stay here in my button jar and I love to play with them sometimes. They're all different. They're all different colors, all different shapes, all different sizes. Some of them are broken and some of them don't have a matching one anymore. You might think they were rejects but they're really not because I collect them all. Some of them are from old coats or an old shirt or sometimes the new ones right that they put inside the, the, um, the seam. So I bet you're wondering though, what buttons have to do with communion? Because it's time for communion now. Well, buttons are a wonderful metaphor for who's invited at the table. Jesus invited everyone to the table. He didn't leave anyone out. We're all welcome. Everyone is welcome. It doesn't matter whether you're broken or you're not partnered or what color you are or where you're from, you're still beautiful. And you don't have to be perfect. No one's perfect, but you're welcome at the table. Let's share together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now what we do at the table, we do in remembrance of Jesus. And the scriptural story tells us that the night before Jesus was betrayed and deserted, he shared a meal in the upper room with his disciples. After the meal, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Each time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of love, the cup of new covenant poured out for all people, for God's love is for all people. Do this in remembrance of me. Just 
close this time together, I want to offer this, this word, this closing that you are very familiar with. Namaste. I must admit, I didn't realize the fullness of that word until, you know, I came here. It always surprises me how come I might have heard of a word but not really grasp what it meant. I, the, the simplest definition of namaste is I bow to you. But the expanded version goes a little deeper. It says, the divine in me sees the divine in you. The spirit in me sees the spirit in you. The light in me sees the light in you. I really like that because it in, invites us to first of all recognize that this spirit, this light, the divine is in us, each one of us. And it also says that it's in each other. It's in whoever you're talking to, whoever you're addressing. But it also this bridge, this, this bridge that covers the gap between you and I is that I am willing to see that divine, that light, that spirit in you. That's a commitment I make for me to see, for me to recognize, for me to acknowledge that yes, I'm not the only one with a light, I'm not the only one with a spirit, I'm not the only one with this divine presence, nor are you, but together I see that divine in you, that light, that spirit in you. And I recognize it, I celebrate it. That's greeting one another. So today, as we prepare to go into the world, as we prepare to go into our struggle, let us do so with namaste, guiding us as we encounter one another, as we cherish ourselves, as we use our skills and our gifts to see the other person. Indeed, namaste. I'm JT. I'm Michelle. I'm Deb. We miss you all. Take care and be safe. Until we meet again, peace, peace be, be with, with you all. Hi, everybody. This is the Country family. I'm here with my husband Joe and Madison and our little pup Winston and we just wanted to uh, take a quick minute to say hi to everyone and we hope everyone is doing well. I know uh, the last few months have certainly not been what any of us expected but hope you are finding some silver linings and making some, uh, some good things come of all of this. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody as soon as possible and uh, definitely miss and want to say hi to all the little kids that uh, I'm missing from the uh, daycare room. So take care, everybody. Peace. Peace. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here um, on behalf of the uh, Green Chalice team and uh, with a wonderful tip that will help the environment. And it, uh, the credit goes to Sandra Kelsey. Um, she is the one that came up with this. So it's actually a, an effective weed killer. Um, and I'm going to show you the ingredients as I, as I talk about them. You need a spray bottle. You need one gallon of white vinegar. Two cups of Epsom salts. And a half, well, a, a, a quarter cup of dish soap. The actual amounts of what you need are in the church announcements. Uh, if you don't have them, I'll be happy to share them with you. Um, so this is evidently, according to Sandra, a very effective way to kill weeds and be kind to the environment. So 
the, anybody with weeds, uh, give it a try, see how you do and, and let us know. Miss you all and look forward to the time when we're back together. Good morning again. Uh, I'm back for the Green Chalice team again because there's an addendum to the weed killer and I'm going to let the pro of gardening tell you what it is. Fish. <laughs> Farmer John here. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, chemical stuff that um, was described earlier is great for weeds that are not uh, in place of or in combination with your grass. Um, if you spray that stuff on grass, it'll kill the grass as well. So we use it in our garden, not near the plants, but, you know, cl well, close to the plants. And we also um, use it on any kind of rock beds or uh, flower beds or anything like that, that you just don't want to kill grass and you just want to kill the weeds. All right. Hopefully that helps. Thank you very much.